just gonna get record here. I think I'm live as soon as I can't really tell. It says it is okay. Well, um, I titled the video how parents program their children to be followers. And I wanted to talk about a couple points. I was just having a conversation with a techno tutor distributor. And uh, they were mentioning something they read in the book that Avery and I wrote, right? And if you haven't read it and you want to get a copy, it's on, uh, you can get a copy at unlockfortnox.com. But in the book, it mentions the word, um, you know, vocation and how the word vocation comes from vocabulary, from the same root word. And I'm going to share something here to kind of get the whole point going of what I wanted to talk about today. But this is really important for parents to consider because the reason why we put our kids in school, uh, well, we don't, Katie and I, but what I mean, we, I just mean parents generally. The reason why we put our kids in school, the reason why we uh, put our kids, uh, the reason why we educate our children is because we want them to be able to survive and live in this world and make money and so forth. And obviously there's a lot more to education than that, but that's in the most limited way, the way we define it. And of course, within the context of education, what most people define it is as schooling. And the word school, the only other usage that I'm aware of in the English language of the word school, other than a school of thought, which is kind of the same kind of context as school, is a school of fish. And so they all move as one. And so the education system, uh, as we know it, which is really the schooling system, and we use those words interchangeably, but education is not the same thing as schooling or school, but we call it the education system, which covers up the reality and the truth of it. But the, the, the starting point of the creation of it was to create a, a generation and generations of workers to work within the industrial system as factory workers, but also, um, you know, uh, nurses, doctors, lawyers, uh, chemists. Um, professors, mathematicians, uh, engineers, architects, um, uh, you know, uh, secretaries, uh, office managers, CEOs, all, all everything in society that we have now that didn't really exist like it does prior to like basically the 1900s, uh, 1920s and so forth. And, you know, before the late 1800s, industrial society. Um, not to say we didn't have doctors or those things, but it wasn't like they were produced in the same way that they are now as like a systematic point of view. And so what most parents think of as education is just so my child can get a job so they can survive in this world. Um, or at least that they can make money. And I know many parents may have an expanded view of education as it's not just about getting a job, but still it's about making money and so forth. But the problem is how you educate a child will determine much more than just um, what kind of job they get, whether they get a job versus become an entrepreneur, for example. It, it determines also how they respond to authority generally. And so one of the main reasons why um, I would never put my children in school is because they learn to obey authority instead of think for themselves. So I'm not saying you should disobey authority. You should look at the point and consider it. And of course you have to follow the law. Um, and if you don't disagree with the law, then you have to support changes politically uh, through the legal political means to change those laws. So it doesn't mean you just blindly follow things just because it's a law. You should follow the law within the realm, within the bounds of it, but then it you can't change it. So there are ways in which you can change laws through politics and so forth. But generally speaking, the way that we um, educate our children will determine whether they question things. Like if you look at what's going on right now with the current coronavirus pandemic, uh, the way in which people are responding to it, the fact that they all think that they should wear masks, even though if you look at the research, um, they can increase the risk of infection. And it's really actually not to your best benefit health-wise to wear the masks. And people are dying while they're exercising because they're wearing masks. And, and you start looking at um, the way in which they are uh, wanting to adjust the schooling system because of it. And actually, I want to go into that too. I'm going to pull up something while I'm talking to make sure I have that article there as well, because 
I saw a really great article about this, uh, about the school system. And I wish I had touched on this on my last video, um, but I just didn't have this one. Uh, let me see here. I'm gonna pull it up while I'm looking at this stuff. Uh, but before I go into that, oh, here it is. Okay, I'm gonna put it on my tabs of the ones you can see. All right, cool. Now I've got it here. Uh, let's see, reach my article limit. Oh, great. So I can't actually look at it. Well, what I'll do is I'll open it up in Chrome. Let's see if they will let me watch it in Chrome or look at it in Chrome. Looks like it. Okay. So I'll come back to that in a moment. I can see it, but you can't. Uh, but I was talking to Asif earlier, and he brought up this really cool point from the book that he mentioned the point about the word vocation and, 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 and vocabulary being similar. And that when he looked up the word vocation, uh, it came up with the word calling. And it was kind of like uh, one is defined as the other and vice versa. So I just looked it up myself to show you all. If you look at the word vocation, it's uh, a strong feeling of suitability for a particular career or occupation a trade or profession, a person's employment or main occupation. And especially uh, regarded as particularly worthy and requiring great dedication. And if you look at the, if you trace back the, the Latin, it goes back to the word uh, vocare, which means to call, which is where the association with the word calling comes from, right? And there's even a old Norse, old English kala, which means to summon loudly to cry out, to cry out to someone in order to summon them to attract their attention. Loud cries of an animal, a strong urge toward a particular way of life or career, a vocation, pers a profession or occupation. But also this cry out to someone in order to summon them or attract their attention, which is the original meaning of the word kala, is to summon loudly. So I was looking at that point and I want to share a couple uh, little perspectives. And how does this relate back to what I was talking about with education? Because your education is actually your vocabulary. Uh, your sum total of your ability to process information, how you understand the world around you, what you think things mean, what you, uh, the value you place on things, the value you place on words, the definitions you have of words, your ability to read or your inability to read, your ability to communicate, your ability to understand other people, your ability to take in information and reorganize it, do something creative with it. That is all the purpose of education. Um, and in a world where we have a competitive capitalist system where uh, profit motive drives everything, of course, that is gonna be channeled into making money. But in an ideal world, it wouldn't have to be only about making money, it would just be about how you express yourself as a living being in this world. Um, but look at the connection of the word vocation, calling, and occupation. And where do most people get their uh, occupation or their calling from? And you probably trace it back to specific um, things that happen in your life, specific uh, experiences. You know, maybe your dad did a certain thing or your mom did a certain thing or your grandfather did something. I know somebody who went to law school because their great grandfather was a Supreme Court justice um, in another country that they're from or that their family's from. So, but, but, but how did they know about that? It was through experiences and then people telling them information and learning about it, seeing photographs, uh, you know, seeing information. And then that impulse is coming from outside that you should do something. So people feel like something is their calling. There's a great book. called, I don't know if you can see that, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. I think that's what it says. I'm reading it backwards on there. By Julian Jaynes. And it's a really cool book. It's, it's not 100% accurate, but it presents an interesting theory about consciousness um, being like a split in the mind into two chambers where then part of the mind could talk to itself. And so, for example, Abraham wasn't hearing the voice of God. He was hearing his own mind talking to him, but he was separating it, not purposefully, but within the way he experienced it, it was separated as a different being. And that the gods talking to people in the past was really just the human, was consciousness talking to people, 
we didn't realize that it was coming from within us. And so um, when you would go to an Oracle, for example, and they would listen to the God's messages, it's really just, they had an ability to read patterns and they were listening to their own thoughts without knowing that it was coming from someone else or, or thinking that it was coming from someone else. People who are schizophrenic embody this and exemplify this where they hear thoughts that they believe are coming from outside of themselves that tell them to do things. But everyone does this to the degree that you just accept that it's your own mind and it's you telling you to do it, but it's not actually, it's, it's your programming. It's information and memories and sounds and words and movies and everything that's been put into you, especially in the first seven years of your life that begins speaking to you, but in many cases in your own voice and you have certain feelings and ideas that pop up and then you start following those things thinking that it's you, but it's really just your programming. And that is where our calling comes from because we have these impulses. So even though it's within you, it's actually coming from outside of you, if that makes sense, because your environment and the people around you imprint on you as a young child. And then that shapes how you process information and how you think and where your thoughts come from and so forth. And then what happens is um, you start listening to that and believing that it's you. And then you kind of don't question it anymore. So people say, well, it's my calling. It's my passion to do something, right? Instead of it being like, I chose to do this and then I'm going to find the enjoyment within it, which is what I did with, with, uh, with techno tutor and everything that I do is and even having kids, for example, we didn't just happen to have kids. We decided to have children. And that's why they're a certain age apart. We created a business on purpose because we saw that there was a problem that was going to affect everyone. And it was only going to make things worse if we didn't. And Katie and I chose to do that, chose to, sol to, to place ourselves in a position to be able to solve that problem. And then we had to find other people willing to be able to work with us. And so that means I don't necessarily enjoy every day. Just like if you go to the gym and you want to get uh, muscular, you don't necessarily enjoy every single day. Sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes it's fun. But you're doing it because you, you know why you're doing it. Um, and so from, from the perspective of why I chose to do what I do, it's not because I had a calling to do it. Like I always wanted to be an educator or I always wanted to be an entrepreneur or whatever the case may be. I specifically chose that point. And I remember when I was younger, around in my early to mid twenties, I went through like a severe depression experience when I was in college. And I remember going and asking many people that I knew people like my relatives and so forth, why they did what they did. And I remember my, my biological dad, so I have an adopted dad as well, but I remember my biological dad said that, you know, what he did kind of fit into the, the machine of society. He didn't use those exact words, but it was like, what he did served a purpose and other people do things and they serve a purpose and he kind of fits into everything else. And I was just like, fuck that, you know, like, obviously I want to fit in and have a purpose, but, but why did you choose specifically what you chose and that's where people come in this i have this calling that's like i'm called to do it in other words there's information that i'm just looking at and just following that information that's why i'm doing what i'm doing i'm not actually setting out like with the exact in starting the end point in mind and that becomes my starting point and i know exactly why i'm doing it it's still like an outside externally imposed thing um which doesn't mean that you need to completely ignore reality which is going back to what I was saying earlier, which is I look at what were the problems in this world that I could see myself having an impact in. Because if we're not here to make this world better, then what else is there? And if anything, that should be our calling, so to speak. But the, the problem with making it a calling is there's nothing calling to you. There's nothing in this world that is saying, make me a better place. In fact, you have to go against every instinct you have, every desire, everything to actually want to do that because we're programmed from a very young age to just fit into the system and basically make money for the system. And we think we're doing it for ourselves, but we're being called to do it because all of the media, the medical system, the entertainment, uh, government, economics, everything is constantly impulsing us with information and our parents and so forth, which becomes like our total understanding of who we are which tells us what to do. And we think that we're directing it, but we're not really. Um, that's why it's so difficult when you get into business and sales, if you're not programmed to do it, because everything's telling you to go back to looking for a job. So there's that, a lot of dimensions to this, obviously, but the first point I wanted to bring up was the fact that the reason we call it a calling is because it's not us actually directing ourselves. So our vocation, our job becomes something we're called to do. In other words, that we're told to do. Um, 
through our experiences and we're not really directing ourselves within it from the perspective of the only thing that's really worth doing is what's best for everybody because that means it's best for me and it's best for everybody else. And if it's not best for everybody else, it can't be best for me because somewhere, some way I'm going to create a consequence on other people that's going to come back to me. So the only way to actually do what's in your own best interest is to do what's best for everyone, um, which doesn't mean self-sacrifice per se, uh, because that would mean it's not best for you. So you have to really be self-honest about what that means. And at the end of the day, what it means is firstly having an education system where each child is supported to develop their full potential and be creative and express themselves and have a life of dignity, which also requires a coordinated economic system and a coordinated uh, media system and entertainment system. Why is it that our, our entertainment is always trying to bring us down to the level of a consumer instead of looking past that, generally speaking? Because it's a product of the consumption system, which wants us to consume more. And so everything is programming us to be less than who we are rather than who we could really be, our real potential. So that's the first point about the word calling and vocation. Now, another reason why I wanted to make this was because I got a text message from someone today who, without going into anything personal, because that's not the point of it, they were mentioning to me that they wanted to, they were implementing a system with their child where they were going to, and I'm paraphrasing on purpose because I'm not trying to make it personal, but they basically wanted to create, they were creating a system with their, with their young child who I think is, you know, kindergarten, first grade, something like that, where they wouldn't, uh, they would have like a system of these are your privileges and these are the things we don't want you to do. And they called it being good and being bad. And if you do something that's good, we're going to point it out. And that way that will reinforce that behavior. And if you do something that's bad, then you would lose privileges. And to the person's credit, they said, you know, we don't really just want to punish them and stuff. So really it's more about pointing out the good things and we're not really using it actually to punish them in any way, but we're creating that as a starting point. And so something they didn't, and I'm sharing this because I think this is an idea that many parents would think of or be like, hey, this is a good thing to do or it makes sense, right? And there's a couple dimensions to it. So if you're a parent, for example, who finds yourself having to, to basically be with your kid full time right now because they can't be in school, and now you're deciding whether they're going to go back to school or not, maybe you might consider homeschooling. Um, and especially if you're going to consider homeschooling, this is something I really would hope that you will consider, is a system like what I was just describing, even though, let's say the parent decides not to actually ever punish for any negative behavior, but only use it to reward and hope that that will then steer the child into the positive behavior. The problem with it is a couple of things. One, you're not developing your child's intellectual capacity to understand why what you're saying is best is actually best and allowing them to choose it of their own free will. Because underlying the system that you've set up that you've, I'm assuming, explained to them, you are telling them that there is a, a potential, even though you may never exercise it and you're probably not gonna tell them that because if you told them that, then of course you know that they're just gonna not listen to you. Uh, then they're gonna just not ever have any fear of doing the wrong thing. So my point is just because you don't ever punish them, they know there's an underlying threat that you could. And if you told them up front, I'm never actually gonna punish you. Here's the good, here's the bad. I'm only gonna reward you for the bad. If you do the bad thing, or the good rather, if you do the bad thing, then we'll take away privileges. But just so you know, I'm never actually gonna do that. I'm only ever gonna point out the good things. I'm actually gonna ignore the bad things. Still the same result because one, if you told them up front everything, then you know the system wouldn't work. So what's the point of it? So presumably you're not gonna tell them that's what you're gonna do. You're just gonna only ever talk about the positives. But even in that sense, you're still training them to respond to positive reinforcement. Instead of understanding why something is best, and then they can make the decision to do it. And you might say, but my child's only two years old or three years old or five or seven or whatever the age is. But this is how you develop the child's ability to understand choice and the consequence of choice by explaining and showing, not by imposing a set of rules that they must follow because they don't understand why those rules, why that thing is good. So my starting point, if I can make a suggestion to anyone doing some kind of system like that, 
rather just explain to them why this is the best choice and what you would do if you were in their shoes and why you would do it and what the consequence is really the real consequence, not the one you would impose, but the real consequence. You know, and part of consequence can be if you tell me you're only going to eat two cookies. Okay, here's the package of cookies. So you're telling me, so they're saying, can I have a cookie? Okay, I'll get down the cookies. But let's agree first how many you're going to have. Okay, how many? Two. Okay, let's agree to have two. Okay, so they grab five. Now what? Okay, now you can say to them, look, I mean, if it was like, if they were literally about to eat a thousand cookies, they would die. So I'm not saying you just let them do whatever, but in the context of whether they have five or two, is that going to make much of a fundamental difference to their life? Not really. So let's say they grab five and you say to them, look, part of the agreement that we have is when I get the cookies down and I let you take them, I'm doing that because I trust that you're going to follow the agreement that we set forth before I got them down, which is that you said you were going to take two. So I'm not going to forcefully take those five or those three away, right? Because you're going to have two and three more is three too many. That's five, right? I'm not going to just take them out of your hand. You can keep them. But the consequence is I'm not going to trust in the future that you're going to stick to your agreement. So if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't make that choice that you're making. I would put the three back. That's sticking to your agreement. It's still having the two that you wanted. So I'm not saying you can't have any cookies. But then next time, I will know that I can trust you that I can get the cookies down and you can take the ones you want. Otherwise, I'll just have to give you the cookies because I also, as a parent, have to consider what's in your best interest health wise. So, from a long term basis, from a consistent basis, you can't have five cookies every day right before bed. And maybe even every day, you can't have two right before bed. But in this particular case, you asked me for two. You said you wanted two. You would get two. I brought them down. I let you take them. And I was trusting that you were only going to take the amount you agreed. So if you break that agreement, then I won't be able to trust you in the future. I will have to then just direct the plan. So that's the consequence you're creating. Now, that conversation probably won't take place when they're one. But it can take place when they're two and a half if you do things properly. And for example, my three and a half year old, we have conversations like that all the time with Max. And so we don't ever punish him for something. Even if he does something against what we agreed to, we don't, we don't, again, unless it's like a sort of a, an immediate, like physical harm sort of situation. Otherwise we don't intervene physically. We just explain what the consequence will be in the future. So like, if he doesn't want to brush his teeth, well, you know, this is why we brush our teeth. Okay. And here's why, what happens if you don't brush your teeth on a consistent basis? And you can choose tonight if you don't really want to, okay? But then if, if next time you don't want to do it, then I'm going to wait in the bathroom until, you know, I'm not going to read any books. I'm going to sit patiently and wait until we brush our teeth, okay? And I'm just telling you in the future, that's what's going to happen. So we're like preparing and explaining. So our child's understanding of why is developing. So he's not doing it out of a fear of being punished or a desire for a reward. You shouldn't brush your teeth because you desire some particular other thing that you're going to get as a reward because that's not going to happen when you're an adult you're not going to get that that toy or whatever that you're promised if you brush your teeth every day this week or whatever the particular privilege is my child doesn't have privileges our children don't have privileges they have rights and they have things that we do for them uh they have a right to food they have a right to take a bath to brush their teeth they have a right to have cookies they have a right to, if, if I'm going to have cookies, why shouldn't they be able to have them? And if they're not, should, if they shouldn't have them right before bed, why should I have them right before bed, right? Is there a difference in the way I process sugar versus them? I would explain that. And I would explain why they should maybe only have one if I have five. But generally speaking, I probably wouldn't just have five right in their face if I'm saying they should only have one. So I can, I can sacrifice a little bit. It's, I'm not, and you know what I mean? Like this desire I have to have cookies is not that important. So you have to look at context, right? But from the perspective of rewarding versus punishing, I really want to emphasize to everybody that's watching, if you want to give your child the best education, realize this is a part of that. Education is not just what school I send them to, what workbooks they work out of. That stuff's very simple. It's how you treat them and what you're programming them with. And if you program them with to seek positive rewards for doing something that's not actually related to that reward, you're programming them to follow. You're programming them to follow some kind of desire. 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you guys can see me with all my animation. You're programming them to, to follow their desires rather than um, consider the actual practicality of the situation, to consider what's actually best, why they actually should or should not do something. Because when they start considering those things, it develops their intellectual capacity to understand the consequences of their choices and what choices are best and what choices are not best. Now, the problem with what I'm suggesting is that many parents themselves as human beings don't think of their own lives like this. They are just following what they like and don't like and avoiding what they don't like because that's what they were programmed to do. But somebody has to break the cycle and you can't put that onto your child to do that later. You have to start doing that now. You have to start looking at, and this is, and part of doing that is considering right now what I'm saying, because you would like to be able to just control your child's behavior because it's more convenient, because it's easier, because you have other things and other responsibilities and so forth. But those are all things that have been giving to you, given to you to do. And now you're stuck in a pattern of survival where it's like, well, if I try to like focus like this on my child, I'll be distracted from other stuff. But you have to look at for, for yourself what really matters to you and do you want to give your child the best education for real or is it just something that you know you got to get it done and, and you know and you got other stuff to do and it's just the one part of thing to me it's it's a principal uh primary point that that is a responsibility of mine uh just as much as i have a responsibility to give my clients the best service or my distributors the best uh, support or um you know, my body, uh, you know, the right hygiene and, and so forth, right? Just like you have a responsibility for those things. You have a responsibility for your child to give them the best education. And part of that is supporting them to develop an intellectual capacity to think for themselves and choose of their own free will. But that only works when they fully understand the consequences. And so if you don't start that now, the child will be limited in their ability to do that later on. And so part of that process of having that is realizing like when you start, if you're starting at a certain age, whatever age that is with your child, there's going to be a transition period where they're learning to develop that point. It's like, it's like if your child is five and they're just now learning to start, or they're just now starting to learn how to swim. There's going to be a period where they're going to have to wear floaties for a bit. You're going to have to hold their hand and be with them or maybe hold them and stuff. Like it's part of the process. But when they're seven, you want them to start thinking for themselves. So if you don't start when they're five or if they're, if they're five now, uh, or if they're three right now, rather, you'd rather them have developed this point by the time they're five. So like my child's three and a half, or one of my children is three and a half, and can think for themselves and choose things and decide a lot more. You know, I can give him scissors and not worry if he's going to go around and cutting up all of the sheets in the house or something like that, or whatever parents fear. I know he's just going to cut the grass and, and cut like plants and stuff, stuff that's not a big deal because we talk about it and he understands. And he's, so he understands what the limits and the boundaries are, not because of a fear that we're gonna punish him if he goes outside of them, because he just understands why he should or shouldn't do certain things and what the consequence is. And if he does go cut the sheets, we explain to him why we prefer he doesn't do that. And the whole context, as much context as possible as why, but then we don't restrict him. You see what I mean? We might say like, hey, in the future, if it becomes a consistent point, we're just not gonna allow scissors in the house to be played with because of whatever but that's never we've never had to do something like that because we push the point to its extreme of really explaining everything as much as possible and so that is is a much more effective approach but it's going to push you as a parent past your limits of what you think is possible and i know many parents have a, even difficulty conceiving that what i'm expressing here probably is possible but that is because of how you've been programmed and how you were brought up and how you were educated and so forth. It, you're, you're not even really doing that, what I'm describing. You're not living from that principle within yourself. And that's why you as a parent must use techno tutor for yourself, even if your child has it. You have to use it for yourself. You have to increase your processing ability. Even if you're really already a smart person and you make a lot of money and so forth, this is the area where you're lacking. So I can talk till I'm blue in the face but if you as a parent don't challenge your programming as to no i need to just get my child to behave a certain way well you're gonna create a follower and if you're looking around at the world right now and you're like man there's a lot of followers a lot of people doing stupid shit because the government said something even though 
clearly you look at the information and it's not really what is happening, what we're being told. Yeah, because they just follow what the authority says. They've been programmed to do it. And if you implement these kind of reward punishment systems, even if it's just the reward or just the punishment, you're going to create a follower, not a child who's critically thinking for themselves and choosing what's best for themselves and others of their own free will. We have to teach our children as the primary focus of education how to exercise freedom within the starting point of understanding consequence. And they can only do that when they have an effective information processing ability. And they do, they get that by one, using TechnoTutor and you providing explanation of things that are outside of the context of their experience. So they develop more context and putting them into other situations and so forth. Um, my, my children are learning about gardening, not just because we're telling them about it or reading in a book, they have a garden. And now we've just built a second garden that's just for Max because he kept wanting to pull all the tomatoes off of the tomato plants. So I said, hey, why don't we just build a garden for him and tell him on this garden, do whatever the hell you want, you know? And over here, we're gonna build you a garden under the agreement that let's not pull the tomatoes off of these plants because we're gonna use those for food and we'll have our own food and that'll be even better than the ones we buy at the store and so forth. And he's like, okay, cool. But on this garden, you can do what you want. And I would suggest not to just pull tomatoes off, but it's your garden. You can do what you want with it and you can cultivate it and we'll help you with it and everything. So now they're building that and he's already got some flowers and so forth in the garden and, and they're, they're gonna be, and I, I think they planted corn and some other stuff too. Um, but you know, Katie and, and, and Seneca was helping him with that and I'm sure she'll have a garden at some point as she gets a little older too. So they're learning about that. So in other words, we're, we're like, that's part of his education, right? And, and when you're learning about how a plant develops in biology, it's so far removed from anything you even care about that it's just like, you memorize it, you forget about it. But Max, when he learns about the full on like biology of how a plant grows, it'll be like, oh, that's what's going on here. And then he'll be able to figure out even more creative ways as to how to, how to help support his plants grow and so forth. And obviously some of that stuff he's already learning because we're talking about it and we watch videos and stuff like that too. But that, that, the, that desire to know more and really apply it will even grow over time as he gets older and develops his vocabulary and his context even more and more. But as a parent, you are the primary provider of the child's context by the environment that you create. If you create an environment where they just gonna follow their desire for positivity or they're avoiding the experience of pain through avoiding negativity you're creating a follower by definition and i just want to share this one more thing where's my chrome let's see if it's going to let me show it i'm not interested here we go san diego area school district brought students back to classrooms for daycare And it says, um, staff enforce, so the kids are coming there because the parents, you know, had to go back to work. Staff is enforcing physical distancing for students, do temperature and health checks for staff and students and give students masks to wear every day. Students are fed snacks and lunch, play outside and work on their distance learning using school provided laptops at desks distanced several feet apart from each other. So literally on, computers just sitting there and this is going to be the future of school this is going to be the future of school because they're putting all this investment and, and energy and focus into um how to teach the kids from home. And I know I have a neighbor who works for the school district. She's been kind of telling me about what they've been doing there. They're not gonna just easily quickly go back to how it was before. It's not gonna happen. Um, let me just check something real quick. Let me check my live stream. Is it still streaming? No, it didn't. That's okay. I'll have this one anyways, because um, I'm recording it. But uh, the schools are not going to necessarily like, probably really go back to full lectures because they have to keep the desks far apart. You can only have so many. The teacher's probably going to have to wear a mask. And if it's not all the time, as soon as anyone gets sick, they're going to have to do it. They have to disinfect everything. They're probably just getting everyone used to that. And so if you're putting your kid back in school, 
they're going to teach them about social distancing. They're going to tell them that everybody has germs and they're going to have to use fear so that the kids don't sneeze on each other and, and want to play with each other. And they're even saying in this article, let me go back to it. Uh, share screen, live producer. No, where is it? Chrome. Let's just go through it. It's a model of what schools may look like when they finally reopen, as well as proof that school can operate with physical distancing and safety measures in place, officials said. Um, use lessons learned from the child care program. Let's see. I mean, look at this. The child care program has been a blessing to Pauline Lucatero, a registered nurse and her husband, a law enforcement officer. They have no family living nearby who could watch their nine-year-old daughter and seven-year-old son while they work. When the pandemic came, they took time off from their jobs to stay home with their kids because they didn't know what else to do for childcare. That is why most parents put their kids in school because they wanna to go to work and they have to go to work. Um, let's see. They've taken, it puts me at ease to know they were doing everything. They've taken, it feels like they've taken all the protocols from school stores and of course healthcare organizations just really blended it together. Her kids were hesitant to go to school at first, she said, but at the end of their first day, they told her they loved it. Yeah, fucking right. <laughs> what school, what, what kid comes home from this and is like, yeah, I loved it. And look, they, they can't even like play with each other. So they sit in their, their desks and then they go to recess and then they can't even play on the play equipment because they have to disinfect everything. We try to think of everything, let's see. Parents are not allowed to stay on campus and must stay in their car when they drop off their kids. Parents wait while a staff member takes their child's temperature and checks for symptoms before allowing their child into the school. They keep a daily log of every child's health and temperature checks. Staff also get a temperature check when they arrive. They have, they work, they have to wear masks and gloves. They receive hazard pay. Uh, they, parents wave goodbye to their kids from their car while staff welcome them to school standing several feet away. It's so hard not to give them a hug. You can't even hug your kids when you drop them off. Daily schedules include time, time for working on their distance learning program, even though they're at school, they're on the computer. Outdoor play and free choice that allows them to choose from coloring and word searches. They're giving them free choice. They have to log how they're feeling by choosing an emoji, emoji character. Then teachers check on the ones that aren't feeling well. Isn't that interesting? Why is it only just now that they're actually giving a fuck how kids feel when they're in school. They didn't care before. Why weren't they asking about that all the time and like having them check every day, like, how are you guys feeling? Do you, are you enjoying yourself? Are you having fun? Like, are you learning? Students don't share anything. Each student is assigned their own laptop, headphone set, box of school supplies, blah, blah, blah. Their own hula hoop, because that's all you get to play with and a jump rope and chalk. They're labeled with your names. You can't share anything. Can't bring anything from home. You have to wear a mask at least whenever they come within six feet of another person. Stay in your assigned classroom, supervise the same staff member all day, no more than take kids in a class. And it's very quiet on the playground because kids can't play with each other. You can't sit near each other during lunchtime, which was part of the fun of going to school was to go to lunch and hang out with your friends and play. Um, you do solitary activities. They can play games with their class, but they have to keep reminding them to not pull to put their masks back up and stay six feet apart. We try to change it up the best we can so they're still having fun. They're still interacting, they're just distanced. Red circle markers on the ground indicate where students should stand while waiting in line for bathroom or going to the classroom. They're asked to wash their hands before and after every outdoor break and they use hand sanitizer before going into the classroom. Listen, and here's the point why I wanted to show you this. The safety of the program relies largely on students following the rules. The kids in the child care program, most of whom are second and third graders, have shown they can. The one thing you can't anticipate is will students follow directions? Stu Star said student, uh, staff emphasizes students the importance of not spreading germs. They sent home health packets about health and safety. We try to maintain it best we can. We just try to keep reinforcing. Look at this, please wait here. Keep your social distance. This is what your children are gonna be impulsed with when they go back to school every single fucking day. So that might seem crazy to some of you. Some parents probably won't even have a problem with it. They'll be grateful. But for those of you who do think it's crazy, when you're punishing and rewarding your child 
rather than just explaining to like, if you just, if you had children who could be competent and you could just explain to them, Hey, don't sneeze on each other, you know, wash your hands, use good hygiene. Of course, I know that wouldn't be good enough in this context. People are paranoid about the virus, but as a parent, if you can see, the thing is they can't trust the kids. Just like they can't trust you when you go to the supermarket. They have to put on the marker here. Here's where you need to stand because you're not going to be able to figure it out for yourself. Even if all of that was legitimate in terms of the paranoia, which it's not, but even if it was, they don't trust you. So they have to enforce it. So it's the same thing with you as a parent with your child is you're trying to enforce their behavior and make them behave a certain way. But what you're doing is creating a policeman in their head, which is the thing that is going to prevent them from being able to access their full creative entrepreneurial abilities. When they be when they get older, because the thing that that real entrepreneurs do is they don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. They 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 look to break the rules. They look to change the rules. They look to expand beyond them. And that's what it means to really be alive is to look at what the constraints are and see how you can expand by improving things. So you're creating followers, and if you send your kids to school, I mean they're definitely creating followers. But if you're going to be the most effective, responsible parent you can, you have to understand that that the way you educate your child is gonna determine whether they become a follower or not. So you need to look at education from that context as well, as to who is my child gonna be based on how I'm treating them, what rules I'm creating or not creating, how I'm interacting, how I'm explaining things or not explaining things, what things I'm teaching them or not teaching them, what videos I'm letting them watch, what TV shows I'm letting them watch, like what are they being impulsed with? What are the examples they're seeing on the TV? Because that's gonna become a part of their subconscious and unconscious programming as they become adults the examples they see, the spitefulness they see between children and children's shows, between adults, um, uh, the way they look at relationships. If they're ch girls, they wanna be a princess and they want a prince charming. And if they're boys, they wanna be a hero and a warrior. So they're more likely to go sign up for the military and shit and not see their spouse as an equal because they have to be the man and do everything. You know, you're, you're programming all that into your child based on everything that you're exposing them to. So my suggestion would be do not impose rule sets but rather explain 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 support your child's development of their intellectual capacity and vocabulary and understanding by having them use tech the tutor daily and do the same for yourself Ex and ex expand your ability as a parent to consider more and to go beyond what you think is possible as a parent by using techno tutor for yourself every day if you don't have techno tutor send me a message and i'll show you uh, how you can take a look at it and also check out the book unlockfortnox.com because that's going to expand your mind probably more than you want it to. So have fun with that. And I'll see you on the next one. All right. Bye, everybody.